Police in Northern Ireland say they're treating the shooting of an off-duty police officer as terrorist-related. Detective Chief Inspector John Caldwell, who had worked on high-profile terror cases himself, is in a critical condition in hospital following Wednesday's attack in front of his son in Oma. Four men have been arrested. The leaders of the five biggest political parties at Stormont have joined the Chief Constable of the Police Service of Northern Ireland to send a message of unity. Police remain at the spot of the brutal attack on Wilma Bailey. BCI John Caldwell was shot multiple times after coaching youth football. While he remains heavily sedated in hospital today, political leaders stood shoulder to shoulder with Northern Ireland's top officer in a rare show of unity. Sadly, on this occasion, the terrorists have stepped home, but we have dealt with a, a number of shots recently. We fortunately haven't seen police officers killed or seriously injured, but we are working around the clock to try and protect the terrorist activities. The main suspects, the new NRA, are an armed group of violent dissident Republicans who object to Northern Ireland being part of the UK. The most powerful message that we, as political leaders, can be able to stand with the police constable today and stand with the police service and to say, this is not good enough, this is an attack on all of us, this is an attack on our community. To the evil people who carried out uh, this heinous attack, you are not the future of this place. Uh, we stand against you. Oma is forever synonymous with the dissident bomb in 1998, which killed 29 people. And a rally was planned for tomorrow to attack the sense of horror at the attack on John Corbyn. People felt that this was an attack. The voice of Leo Wilson telling us about the and the right to the Canadian must stand together. At work, senior detective John Corbyn was respected for bringing terrorists to justice. But here, how the picture looks at the case for local soldiers and many are praying to be free. Emma Barbie, BBC News, Ireland. John Finty has confirmed that three candidates are in the race to succeed Nicholas Sturgeon as party leader and first minister of Scotland. Kate Forbes, Ashley Egan and Henry Wilson all secured enough nominations to make it onto the ballot paper. Voting begins on March the 13th and will close on the 27th. But there is a game to be on Stepping into the spotlight, Ash Deacon's campaign is calling her the underdog. She is calling on campaigners for Scottish independence to give out. The truth is that our movement has been divided for far too long by personal differences and personal agendas. Instead, she promised a relentless focus on independence. Insisting an election victory at Holyrood or Westminster would provide a mandate. You have said that you explicitly declare in your manuscript for line one, line one, that should you achieve a majority of seats and votes, so then day one yeah. of being in power, you would open negotiations. Absolutely right. With whom? With you to work on day one. Yeah. And if they don't come? Okay. You've got to move Guys, on only one more egg. Uh, Excited to see what it is.
A rescue operation has been launched after a count of two people on board capsized in the River Clyde at Greenock. Emergency crews were called after the count overturned. Images from the scene show rescue teams and a police boat surrounding the capsized vessel. The time is ten past six. In a moment, we'll be joining my colleague Clive Myrie in Kiel. But first, our top story this evening. Junior doctors in England announced three days of back-to-back -back strikes in March, set to affect both routine and emergency care. And disappointment for England, knocked out by South Africa in a nail-biting T20 World Cup semi-final. <laughs> And the bakery is getting tougher to sign, and they're responding to the earthquake victims in Turkey and Syria. Welcome to the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, where exactly one year ago today, before dawn, the people of this city were woken up by the sound of air raid sirens signaling Russia's invasion. What followed has been a year of tears and savagery defiance and hope. Many thousands have died. We've seen the worst fighting and refugee emergency on European soil since 1945. There's global food insecurity and a major energy crisis. All because of a war of choice. Let's take a look at a map of Ukrainian territory over the period of the war so far. Now, before the invasion, Luhansk and Donetsk in the east were held by Russian-backed separatists. Here in yellow. Crimea was of course illegally annexed by Russia in 2014. But a few weeks into last year's invasion, large parts of the southeast, southeast and north of Ukraine were under Russian military control. However, Ukraine has fought back thanks to artillery from Europe and America and seen that much of the north as well. Russia still occupies large parts of the south. And that's why the course of fighting is currently taking place and our senior international correspondent, Ola Gary, and cameraman, Vox Alcoyot, have been on the front line with Ukrainian troops in the town of Gidnidar and the central city. East in the forest, near the town of Gidnidar, we get a close-up of the war. <coughs> The daily battle to hold off the Russians. We are willing to have given up either. Inside the town, Ukrainian troops love mortars and obscenities. <coughs> Moving fast to avoid being. This Pokemon I'm battling with is Gotham. We have heard the front line of soldiers at the heart of the battle. <laughs> Their commander, codenamed Beast, has been up all night fighting. How far away are the nearest Russian positions? One kilometer. One kilometer. 